Welcome to Cambridge Forum, discussing empires of food with author Andrew Remus. I'm David Leslie, Executive Director of Food for Free in Cambridge. We are what we eat. As ancient civilizations reached the limits of their ability to provide food, their people starved or scattered and their civilizations disappeared. As new foods, think of the tomato, were introduced into a culture, that culture changed along with its food ways. In his latest book, Empires of Food, Feast, Famine, and the Fall of Civilizations, co-authored with University of Leeds agricultural expert, Dr. Evan D.G. Fraser, Andrew Remus, vivid, Rem, Andrew Remus vividly chronicles the fate of people over the past 12,000 years through the food they ate and provides devastating insights into what to expect in years to come. What are the weaknesses in our 21st century food system? If our food supplies failed, as has happened to every other human civilization in the past, how would we feed America's 300 plus millions? What can we do to avoid this possible calamity? Andrew Remus is a journalist and the managing editor at the Improper Bostonian Magazine. Previously, he was the associate editor and staff writer at Boston Magazine. His work frequently appeared in those publications and in the Boston Globe Magazine and the Boston Globe. He and Dr. Fraser previously co-wrote Beef, the untold story of how milk, meat, and muscle shape the world. Welcome, Andrew Remus, to Cambridge Forum. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you, Pat, and thank you all for braving the inclement weather and coming here today. I know it's a bit of a hardship to uh, walk through these streets right now, but um, thank you all for coming here because I do think it's kind of an interesting topic, or I hope it is. Um, I guess I would like to just start by making a few remarks about how the book came to be. Um, Evan and I uh, co-wrote Beef, uh, the untold story of how milk, meat, and muscle shaped the world a few years back. And what started off as a lighthearted cultural history of cattle, if such a thing can be said, um, gradually evolved into an essay on industrialization. Now, Evan is a uh, professor of sustainable agriculture at the University of Guelph in Canada now. And um, he brought to bear upon our topic a lot of questions about our food supply and uh, how these animals went from being cultural uh, and uh, very important cultural and religious icons into becoming commodities. And through our research into that, we started asking some broader questions about how food relates to society in general, um, why some societies are successful with food and why they fall apart with their food supply. And it led us to the topic of the current book that we have out, um, which is Empires of Food. Um, and in our re research and in our work, and particularly in our study of uh, civilizations from Mesopotamia up until uh, the 19th century British Empire and today, we found a pattern of three, I suppose, um, three things that every society needs in order to thrive with its food supply. Uh, or to create what we call a food empire, which is an inter, uh, which is a, a network of farms, transportation networks, markets, and consumers that are the basis really for most urban societies. And what we found is that, first of all, you need a surplus. You need farmers growing more than they're eating. Then you need a means to store and transport that surplus so that Grain can go along barges, can go onto barges or into ox carts and trundle up hillsides and into the various stew pots and uh, hearths of uh, people in different areas. And then you need a means of exchange. You need some form of a market system in order for people to actually want to do all this. And if a society creates those three elements, then it is able to expand. So, for instance, going back to ancient Mesopotamia. We had these factors coming together uh, for one of the, in one of the first times in history, and 
people found that it led to population growth, urbanization, uh, and all the blooming, sometimes pungent flowers of civilization. So things like art and government and religion and all that fun stuff, which is, of course, based on the wealth engendered by food. So that's all well and good. But these food empires tend not to last forever. Um, ancient Sumeria is not doing very well right now. They, um, they tend to make the same mistakes, is another of the things uh, we found. Food empires tend to make a couple of assumptions w w which fall on their faces. The first assumption they tend to make is that soil always maintains its fertility, and that soil will always have nutrients in it and will be able to grow the same degree of, of uh, or able, will be able to support the same amount of productivity that it always has. And this tends not to be the case. Um, soil degrades if you farm it uh, intensively for a long time, and you can add inputs, you can put fertilizer on it, but um, unless it's carefully managed, it does tend to degrade. Uh, the second assumption that most food empires make is that uh, the good weather will always stay good. And if you look at historical timelines of uh, weather patterns, we found that in certain periods where urban civilization really flourished, for instance, uh, during the ancient Minoan period, during the peak of the Roman Empire, during the height of medieval civilization, there have been spikes of temperature and spikes of um, good conditions for growing cereal crops. So the weather got warmer, the winters got milder, the rainfall was adequate but not too much, and cereal crops were able to really flourish during these periods, which helped these civilizations maintain a high level of productivity. Um, but of course, what climate changes as we're seeing right now, rather rapidly. The last assumption is that it's a good idea to specialize in growing crops that, that prove profitable. So, for instance, um, it makes sense if a farmer finds that his valley is very good at growing grain, to grow a lot of grain in that valley, and then sell it to the guy up the hill who happens to have a farm that specializes in sheep. So this is very standard economics and um, tends to make sense economically. That doesn't always translate into good ecology. And um, if you specialize in a particular crop, it tends to make for a weaker ecosystem, if, particularly if it's a, a single, a cultivar of, say, wheat or rice, it makes it more open to the threats of uh, uninclement fungus or a particularly nasty insect that has a taste for millet or what have you. And this happens over and over again that if you have an area which is too much focused on one specialized crop, uh, it becomes more threatened environmentally. So these are three assumptions which people have been making throughout all, uh, pretty much all of history, and they're not very good assumptions to rest a civilization on. Um, I guess to illustrate this, we can take a simple food empire, one of the simplest ones that, uh, that we used in our book, and that is medieval Europe. Now, medieval Europe went through a period of very rapid expansion and population growth from about 900 AD to about 1300 AD. And during this period, it was driven by the economic engine of uh, agricultural expansion through the monasteries. It was uh, actually a wonderful success story with a lot of, um, I, I suppose, lessons to, uh, that we could take today. Uh, the monks went out into essentially virgin territory in the woodlands of Europe, and through hard labor and ax and plow, they would clear the forests, plant grain fields, create communities which then grew up around their industry. Then they created trading networks between the monasteries, selling, uh, converting their grain and barley into beer, their milk into cheese, into non-perishables that they could then carry along the rivers or, or along roads and trade to other communities that had grown up around other monasteries. And this was the basis for urbanization and for wealth. And uh, the population grew. Uh, the monks got richer, the monasteries got richer, they started to be able to do things like build cathedrals and uh, spend a lot of time, I, I suppose, uh, writing plain chant hymns. And uh, medieval culture flourished. 
the, um, the problem was, of course, that the population continued to expand on this basis, and the monks continued to expand their, uh, their farms, and uh, as they ran out of the uh, areas around the monasteries, they pushed the farms up into hillsides, they pushed the farms up into marginal lands, which they stripped of trees. If you strip a hillside of trees, it, it tends to have uh, the effect of denuding the, uh, the soil. You remove the roots uh, and start farming grain, for instance, on a hillside, in a fairly short period of time, uh, that topsoil will wash away and uh, lower producti productivity. So by about the year 1300, uh, the population had grown, demand for food had grown throughout Europe, yet the ability to produce food was going down, and therefore food prices started to go up. This was a first indicator of a century of uh, some of real unpleasantness in the 14th century uh, when you started to see things like catastrophic famines that wiped out 20% of the population and left, the, uh, and left Europe reeling and weakened for the onset of the bubonic plague in 1347 where you uh, had a breakdown in law, you had increased lawlessness, you had increased um, chaos and social unrest. But uh, what happened in the 14th century was I suppose the main social effect was that you lost 40% of the population, which um, I suppose could be rather traumatic. Um, so that's a simple food empire story. Of course, we're not the medieval Europeans. We, we have a very different situation. But um, another historical example before, before I move on from history uh, is ancient Rome, which was a very complicated food empire with using very simple technology. You had an urban civilization. You had the city of Rome with a million, a million souls by uh, around the year uh, 100 AD or 200 AD. Yet you had uh, hinterlands around the urban areas that had been overworked even during Republican times. So that by the time period of the empire, in order to just maintain a city like Rome, you had to import grain from as far away as North Africa and Egypt. Now. You can't do that unless you actually force the people in North Africa and Egypt to give it to you. So therefore you need legions, therefore you need armies, therefore you need uh, military campaigns, and that's exactly what Rome did. One of the reasons that they kept, uh, that, I mean, they say that an army marches on its stomach, but in a lot of ways the Roman legions marched for their stomachs as well. So as Rome expanded its reach, um, it drew in food from its hinterlands, and drew in food from increasingly outlying areas. But um, it too suffered from the uh, traps of good weather and the assumption that soil doesn't de uh, degrade. So when the weather did start getting cooler and when crop yields did start getting lower all over the place, it, Rome had a tough time dealing with it. Um, by the population of the city of Rome itself went through uh, during uh, between 300 and 400 AD, fell by about 60%. And civilization shrank back once these factors kicked in. Uh, the emperor started collecting taxes and grain instead of money. And the western part certainly immediately fell into a steep decline. The eastern took a little longer due to um, some additional supports and buttresses they had, but that too eventually uh, pulled back. So what are the lessons of, of these food empires for today? Um, the big one is that we think we've overcome these limitations through technology. And to a large degree, we have. About 100 years ago or so, a German scientist, Fritz Haber, uh, helped invent something called the Haber-Bosch process of fixing chemical nitrogen, which is to create artificial fertilizer. We weren't able to, we would not be able supporting nine, six billion people on this planet today if we simply used uh, dung and legumes on our fields. We've needed chemical fertilizers on our fields in order to increase productivity to the point where we can actually build up the bodies, build the proteins of six billion people. And um, that has given us, of course, the, the tremendous growth and success of the 20th century, but it's also given us a bit of a false economy because 
yes, we have chemical fertilizer and we're no longer dependent on natural nitrogen, yet we're now dependent on the process to make chemical fertilizer. And you can't make chemical fertilizer without fossil fuels. So as energy costs go up, obviously so will our food costs. As energy supplies go down, it raises the question of how we'll continue to make so much chemical fertilizer. Um, of course, on the other end of the spectrum, we've, or not on the other end of the spectrum, but uh, the other factor of climate change. We're now seeing, a, I think most people can acknowledge, a rising in temperatures. Now, in the past, rising temperatures have meant more productivity. Yet, either end of a thermometer makes pretty grim reading for a farmer. So, as we see global warming really kick in over the next century, uh, yes, we may see some spike in productivity in certain areas of the planet for a certain while, but in general, it's going to make conditions a little more difficult for um, keeping up our, uh, our food supplies and keeping up our uh, cereal crops at the same rate that we've had. We, the 20th century saw ideal conditions for growing cereal crops really uh, between the, the end of the Dust Bowl and, and the end of the 20th century, but now things are getting hotter. As for specialization, the other part of the trap, um, 20 crops make up 90% of the world's food right now. Most of that, of course, is wheat, rice, uh, corn, soy. That is, there, there are entire landscapes in the Midwest, in the Ukraine, in northern China, devoted entirely to monocultures, to single crops, which, as an, ecologi an ecologist will tell you, are very, very um, sensitive towards environmental shocks. So as uh, climatic shocks become more common, perhaps, over the course of the century, those landscapes may themselves become more vulnerable. And they're also grown with naturally chemical fertilizers, which require a lot of inputs, which require a lot of fossil fuels. And they're also very profligate with water. So again, we're looking at a question of resources. As the, 20, as the 21st century progresses and we see our population climb to an estimated 9 billion by the year 2050, it does raise the question of how are we going to feed ourselves? And it does raise the question of food security. Um, that's, of course, further exacerbated by the fact that our soil isn't getting any healthier. Uh, 75 billion tons of topsoil wash into the oceans each year. And with population growth uh, in Asia, uh, an increase in the urban diet in places like China and India, uh, a growing taste for meat, a growing taste for processed foods, it does raise a lot of alarming questions. Um, for six of the last 11 years, the world has eaten more than it's produced. Now, we've seen bumper, we've seen record crops for a number of those years. And in the past, human beings tended to have found technological fixes eventually for, for the, these problems, but there are indicators that we should be troubled. And one of those really is from the uh, UN's Food and Agricultural Organization's index. Uh, which shows that of the last 11 years, six, we ate more than we produced and we broke even for a seventh. So what are the fixes? I mean, what can we do about this? And there are a couple of them. They're not terribly glamorous though. I mean, we could hope that technology finds a quick fix. That's one way to look forward to to the future, assume that we'll be able to figure out a way to find uh, a better strain of wheat that can survive under more arid conditions and requires fewer uh, inputs and well, those ones being natural. It's, it's a possibility, of course. Um, another is to uh, use the sexy term, nested bioregionalism would be to approach our farms from the point of view of specializing in large regions according to what those regions are best suited to produce, yet maintaining ecologic diversity within those regions. So th that sounds like a bit of a contradiction, but it's not quite. The analogy that, I, um, that Evan and I have used is, think of it, uh, our farming areas like a stock portfolio. You may want to invest heavily in IT stocks, yet 
in order to um, keep things just a little safe in case of a, of a rough economic climate, throw in a few manufacturing stocks and then keep some cash reserves on hand. In a landscape, that would mean instead of planting a single cultivar of wheat across uh, an entire region, you would have wheat producing regions still specialize in grain, but mix it up, break up the different types of, of wheat, break up the fields with hedgerows, try to use more natural inputs, and then trade uh, to other areas which have uh, specialized in livestock. But instead of having a carbon copy sheep every five feet, you would have different breeds. You would have mixed farms which uh, have different sorts of animals. This may lower immediate profits. This may make things a little more difficult to uh, fill the supermarkets cheaply for the moment, but it would lead, hopefully, to uh, a more sustainable future. And um, another topic that is, seems increasingly relevant, uh, particularly uh, in the past year, which saw such a difficulties with the food supplies and food prices um, due to the drought in Russia, due to um, climatic factors last summer, uh, is food storage. We don't really save much food anymore. We don't really have much of a strategic grain reserve. That idea kind of fell apart with the Washington Consensus in the 1980s. And it used to be um, the UN had this grand ambition to fill silos in Africa full of grain to be used in an emergency. So, for instance, in the case of Malawi, uh, where Evan visited a few years ago, when they actually did have a famine strike there and they opened the strategic grain reserve, uh, they found that it was empty because government officials had, corrupt government officials had sold it all off on the black market. Um, but it hadn't been enforced. No one was really that surprised. So one of the suggestions uh, that we put forward is to try to rebuild a strategic grain reserve, uh, or at least the idea of one, in the event of dry years to come, because there will be more dry years. There was one last year. Uh, 925 million people were classified last year as undernourished, and it's expected another 75 million will be added to that this year. Uh, the um, food prices spiked last year again. Uh, they had spiked previously in 2008, but last year they, they really spiked largely because of droughts in, in Russia due to uh, countries like China increasing, flexing their buying power and buying a lot more food on the markets. And this of course means that there's fewer, less food to be for the mar on the market for countries in Africa, for countries that don't have the, uh, the capital, that don't have the buying power. And that can lead of course to social unrest which we've seen in riots in, in uh, places like Zimbabwe. And um, in 2008, of course, there were riots across much of uh, the developing world due to food prices. Um, how am I doing on time? Am I, am I doing that? I'm fine, okay. Um, so I guess the last point I would like to make is that food prices are tied to uh, social unrest and, and to society but not always in the way that we expect them to be. When people see that the cost of a loaf of bread goes up, they don't immediately take to the streets and start you know, demanding the guillotine. They usually wait it out. They're usually patient. Of the 925 million undernourished people in the world today, very few of them are rioting. Yet, uh, there are a lot of connections made, this, uh, certainly in the past few months, between food prices and the unrest in uh, the Middle East. The psychology of that, um, I believe, has to do with the perception of injustice, which instead of when people believe they're being exploited, when people believe that they can no longer fill their shopping baskets or put the food on the table that they used to do, not on account of a lack of food, but on account of profiteering, on account of uh, a middleman taking too fat of a cut, that is when they start to get angry, and that is when they start to demand a change of government, and that's when they start to uh, riot in the streets. And we've seen this historically um, over and over. We saw it uh, in the early 20th century in this country, in the food riots in New York in 1917, 
when uh, housewives took to the streets and stormed the Waldorf Astoria due to a spike in food prices that they believed didn't have to do with the actual supply, but which they saw as the result of greedy, manipulating merchants. Because people tend to think about food in different ways than they think about other commodities. You know, food isn't pig iron. Food isn't, isn't copper. Food is seen as a right, and people will always view it as ontologically distinct from other commodities. So when food prices do go up, and they are going up, it will lead to some unrest, and it will lead to people questioning maybe the way that uh, we approach our, our control of food, and our use of food, and our distribution of food. Um, and I think on that note, I can turn it over to discussion. Great. I think I had all the, all the major notes. Thank you. You're joining us at Cambridge Forum discussing empires of food. Well done, Andrew. Your book, Empires of Food, is entertaining, it's provocative, it's informative, and most of all, important. For those here this evening, we're listening on the radio. If you are concerned about the direction of global societies in the 21st century, I urge you to read this book. It's that important. So to start things off, Andrew, uh, I have a question. There were numerous common factors which you and Evan note regarding the rise and the fall of civilizations. There's the environment, especially soil fertility and soil depletion. There's climate and weather and changes in both over the millennia. There's the need for reliable food sources and systems, the desire for wealth, the work of building a society and a food system, and the challenges of maintaining it over decades and centuries. And of course, there's greed. My question is, what are the role of unintended consequences? In reading your book, it never came across to me that these empires sought their own demise. On the contrary, each civilization fought against its collapse, and typically, each hastened its fall through the ruination of its agricultural base and food systems. If indeed the consequences were all uh, not intended, what most of all, most of these, compelled civilizations to repeat errors over and over? And how might we avoid these unintended consequences in future generations? Well, thank you for starting things off, David. Um, I think as a species, we're not very good prophets. I don't think we really have it in us. We, let's take the example of, um, I suppose, the, the Sumerians. Um, during the very centuries when Sumerian culture was at its peak and really thriving, they were the, feeding themselves and trading uh, by growing barley in fields that were irrigated uh, with water from the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Now, if you irrigate a field in that area of Mesopotamia with uh, water that's flowed through a canal that you've dug, that water tends to pick up a lot of salt. So when you pour it onto the field and you have a, a hot uh, Middle Eastern summer, the water evaporates and leaves salt on the field. Salting a field kills it. So in the very centuries where uh, the Sumerians had their most tremendous growth and their big surpluses that they were selling off to uh, communities on the Red Sea for copper and for ore and for worked goods, they were salting their very fields and they were destroying the basis of their own civilization. Now, they noticed that crop yields were going down. They didn't quite figure out why, but they certainly saw things receding, even at the moment of power, but they didn't change it because it had worked in the past. I think we're getting kind of into almost Jared Diamond collapse territory here of, of why culturally um, do we repeat our mistakes? And it is because, on the, to one degree, we can shrug our shoulders and say because we're human. Uh, but on the other hand, we, we do have things like climate modeling now, and we do have things like um, history books. So we can make some forecasts, and we can make some intelligent guesses at what the future holds. 
One of the reasons that we don't make policy shifts, one of the reasons that you know, once society is on one path, it's very hard to move it aside, is because these decisions tend to be unprofitable or they tend to be painful. If we're going to force, for instance, uh, Washington to pass legislation demanding that uh, we encourage more uh, sustainable agricultural practices, we're going to really actually have to have the, uh, the political will to do so. And without the political and economic will, it's very hard to steer the, I suppose, ship of society in another direction. I mean, I think that's largely happening to a degree because there has been a cultural shift, certainly regarding food in the past decade. Um, I think that people nowadays, whether it just be by uh, throwing a cup in the recycling bin or you know, no, deciding to buy a pint of organic milk instead of uh, regular milk, uh, people are, certainly have had a lot of these watchwords sink into their consciousness. And I think there's been a very big cultural shift, certainly with food culture, with, with organizations like Slow Food, which, which have grown tremendously in, in uh, I think, reach culturally now. Um, there's, there are very few Americans who don't have some inkling, at least, that you know, if you see a Ben & Jerry's tub of ice cream, there might be some social good there in some vague way. And I, uh, I think that that shift is extremely important, and that one needs to be continued encouraged by, um, by, by education, by the media, and hopefully by our politicians. But um, I, I suppose it depends on how optimistic you are. Does that help? The conversation? Absolutely. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Okay. Hmm. Uh, you're joining Cambridge Forum as we continue our discussion of empires of food with author Andrew Remus. What does the relationship between food and the rise and fall of civilizations suggest for the food security of our own warming planet? Let's take some questions from the audience and please step right up to the mic and people can line up behind our first speaker if there are more than one question out there. Hi, my name's Roger Shamel. I'm with the Global Warming Education Network of Lexington. My question is, have you seen in any of your study of these past civilizations that there were folks who said we need to change who were ignored, or weren't they smart enough hmm. to do that? Because I notice today we do have 98% of our scientists and many uh, other people from the medical and social justice organizations saying we must address climate change, but we continue on the same path. And um, is this a unique situation that we are saying we need to change, but we don't? Or have you seen this before, too? Um, thank you, Roger, for that question. Very good one. I, uh, um, we are unique, obviously, in the tools we have. We've certainly never had computer models of, of, of climate forecasts. We've certainly never had the ability to uh, reach back in the past and, and be able to, to formulate ideas on, on what we're going to be uh, seeing in the future so well. Of course, but I wouldn't say that uh, it, it, it never happened before that people didn't notice what was going on and complain about it. Uh, human beings, as well as being awful prophets, are very good at complaining. Uh, I believe it was Aristotle who wrote some pretty scathing things about the current status of agriculture in ancient Greece. And this was, uh, I guess, in the fourth century BC, wherein he uh, looked back on historical records or looked back perhaps on folk memory and said that the farms that used to sustain uh, their ancestors were now just growing nothing but rocks. And so there certainly was a perception that things are getting worse. And why exactly they were getting worse, uh, I don't think the ancient Greeks did have a, a uh, clear idea of soil degradation and the causes of it. But they certainly did see the effects. And uh, the Romans, for instance, certainly did try to arrest the, these causes. So did the Mycenaeans. They built terraces on their hillsides in order to try to prevent soil erosion. Yet they didn't change their practices, um, presumably for not truly knowing what the future would bring and hoping that, you know, they, they still had faith in prayer, I think. Um, but that's not much of a basis for policy. And I think the, um, we are unique in that we have an extraordinary set of tools and, and uh, very clear choices before us. 
Uh, people in the past were certainly no stupider, but they, uh, they were less privileged. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kendra Gray, and uh, my question is about subsidies. Um, I am. Uh, I get very frustrated with uh, farm subsidies because it allows specifically the United States to grow a lot of corn, um, which allows us to grow a lot of beef relatively cheap, cheaply and come up with uh, high fructose corn syrup and things like that. It also allows us to dump in countries like uh, Mexico and destroy their market. So I guess I'm wondering, in your research, did you come up with, is the United States um, and Western Europe it, are food subsidies something that's sort of new in the past several decades, or has it been going on for, for centuries, and, and how did it work out for other groups? Hmm. Thank you very much for your question, Kendra, and a very good one. Um, now subsidies have obviously are one of the, the major uh, factors, I suppose, in, in today's food empire, and one of the major causes for the fact that our, our, uh, our prices are very different from our costs. And, um, Yes, what we pay for our uh, pound of steak is very different from the actual cost to the environment, to our taxes, to the world in general, and we're quite well aware of that. Um, have other societies subsidized food in that way? Not from my recollection, not precisely in the same way, but they certainly have subsidized food. I think the Romans are, are a great example of uh, people who had a very direct food dole to the citizenry of, of urban areas where you get a certain amount of grain handed to you uh, for free, just for being a citizen. Now, of course, what does that grain cost? That grain costs uh, the taxes that it takes to create an army to go out and conquer Egypt. It, co it, uh, it costs the, um, the political will to field a fleet of grain ships. So in many ways, I guess the, the cost of those grain were contained within the Roman political system and within, I guess, uh, the corruption within the Roman political system because you ended up getting a lot of private individuals who were able to put their money in there and control the system and manipulate it that way. Um, I don't think the world has ever seen anything like what we're seeing now, which is such a wholesale transfer of uh, tax revenues uh, into creating uh, really the, these false uh, the, 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 these, these false industries of, of agriculture. Um, this, I think, is something that, that is unique to our, our modern food empire and uh, is one of the reasons that I think it's, it's survived in secret to a large degree or it's masked its public, uh, uh, its true public face for so long because um, when you get cheap beef, you tend to eat it. And uh, that was much of the subject of our last book. Human beings have always, um, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, but uh, there is such a thing as uh, an enticing one. And um, I think um, it's a good thing that there's increasing awareness of, of, these, um, of these programs, of these subsidies. I think more and more people are aware of them, more, more people are outraged by them. So that, I think, is certainly moving in the right direction. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Fillingham. Um, my parents were members of Nature Conservancy before me, and I still am. And um, I'm uh, a member of NOFA, and we're right now trying to start a uh, organic farm in Roxbury, right at the entrance to no Roxbury. Um, and. I think the principles of uh, Nature Conservancy are very relevant to what we're talking about. Um, the ecologists there have a, a new manifesto, and they're saying essentially that everybody universally deserves clean water, nutritious food, a safe place to live, health care, and a job. And that nobody believes in biodiversity anymore. They'll abuse the environment all they can in order to um, survive. And if we support people in this way, they'll stop abusing the environment, but they'll also stop setting up false 
industries around essentials like food. And I was wondering if you could comment on that, please. Thank you, David. Um, I think what you just mentioned, uh, that people, uh, that one of the, the items in the manifesto is that everyone has a right to food, uh, plays very much into what I was talking about earlier about social unrest and the idea that food is ontologically distinct from other commodities. Because we really do, um, it's very hard to really accept the idea that people can profit off of food when uh, other people are going hungry. That, that just seems to kind of strike to, to one of the cores of uh, people's um, sense of, of morality and ethics. And that is, is one of the reasons why um, People took to the streets, uh, certainly in, uh, in 1917 in New York, why they took to the streets in 1789 in Paris. And that, uh, that psychological distinction, well, let me refer to an anecdote uh, from um, Zimbabwe a few years back. Um, some friends of Evans, uh, they were uh, researchers in Zimbabwe, and well, they're from there. And they were present during the food riots of 2008. And the food riots there started uh, due to an increase in the price of fuel. So the taxi drivers started to get angry and go on protest. But this very quickly led to uh, stores being shuttered and uh, loaves of bread being sold that were smaller than they had been a week ago, but the merchants were charging the same price for. So that was really what sparked, it wasn't the fact that there wasn't any bread in the marketplace, it was the fact that suddenly the housewives were seeing that they were getting less for their money and they were seeing the merchants still charging, you know, keeping their cash registers going and still having lots of stock, but seeing that their, uh, their money wasn't going as far in the shopping basket, that's what took them to pick up bricks and throw them through the windows. And uh, that's what left a number of people dead during the rioting as well. So. It goes back to, uh, to again, our, our idea that somehow or another we are guaranteed a, uh, a, a right to eat. Um, the old English law, the size of bread, uh, which goes back to medieval times, guaranteed a price for bread to, uh, the, um, to, to, to English commoners. Markets were fixed. Merchants weren't able to charge anything they wanted and uh, the poor were allowed to buy at the first bell of the market so that they could get the lowest prices. This, of course, was swept away in the 18th century with the uh, advent of Adam Smith and his ideas, uh, who, and Adam Smith argued that really the, the, the correct thing to do would be to let uh, bread find its natural level of price, and this would mean that um, you'd get a have some supplies withheld for a moment of hunger so that some mer merchants would hoard and release their food onto the market when times got rough. And therefore, there would always be a supply. And, um, well, we, we've seen how that works out. So thank you for your question. Hi, thank you. Hello. S Steve Gluck, Secretarian Society. Hi. We live in a society of, uh, with an obsession of wealth and power, of celebrity and spectacle. In a society that's the economics of which draw all the money toward the top so that people like Donald Trump can revel in what he would call the beauty of his wealth and Oprah Winfrey can give crap away. But when you get to that world, you don't see what's going on on the ground. You don't see the deg degradation of land, the loss of biodiversity, the displacement of peoples. And so there seems to be a sentiment that we're concerned with, this, with the threat to our civilization that, uh, that food resources or the, or the diminishing availability of food resources might bring when the actual question should be, what can we do to hasten the decline of this civilization that's devoted to wealth and power, celebrity, and spectacle? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Steve. Um, all right, to hasten the, the decline of this society, um, let me think about that. Are you familiar with the Black Mountain Project? Um, no? 
it's, um, it's an interesting organization. Uh, it started up in, in Britain where uh, they, uh, the central premise of it is um, we've lost, we're done. Uh, climate change is here, there's no way we can really salvage things. We might as well just find the cultural tools to move on and deal with a uh, society that has you know, peak oil, uh, loss of the environment, it's all gonna happen, it's done. And um, they have a wonderful website. Um, they also have some um, very interesting essays and interesting, uh, and interesting writing about the topic. Um, I personally find that a little, um, uh, I suppose, pessimistic. Um, I do think that, that we still can figure out ways to, uh, to maintain what is good in our society and uh, improve it. Um, so I, I'm, I don't fall entirely on, on uh, the, uh, uh, the perspective of uh, it's best to, to get rid of what we have. Um, but I think probably a lot of people do share your, your point of view, Steve. And um, no, history will prove someone right, I suppose. Thank you for your uh, comment. Hi, uh, thank you for taking our questions tonight. Uh, my name is Elise Garvey. I'm a graduate student at Tufts University. And one of the issues that uh, we haven't touched on yet tonight is, uh, are, the, are the issues of waste, both waste uh, in the developed countries context where people are either buying food and not using it or throwing it away, and um, for the situation facing developing countries where either there's waste in transportation, storage, you know, there, there isn't the infrastructure to, to hold food. Um, are there historical lessons um, for wasted food um, from what you've researched? For wasted food, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, because we never really had the abundance uh, to, to waste food until relatively recently. So historically, I think we really are facing a new problem. I mean, this, this is, we've never had a planet where obesity was such a factor in terms of health. We've never had a society in which uh, we did have malnourished people and obese people filling uh, um, our hospitals. Um, I suppose it, it's really always been a question of less rather than more. Um, we've only, only since the Industrial Revolution have we actually attained the levels of diet that we enjoyed uh, in the, the pre-agricultural age. You know, finally our bodies have, have regained the stature that they had before we stooped down and started to uh, you know, dig in, um, in the Neolithic and, and grow crops, uh, grain crops, which stunted our diets and, and lowered our life expectancy. Um, so in terms of waste, I, I do think this is, this is new ground. Um, storage has always been a problem. Storage has always been one of the factors uh, that limited food empires and that limited the abilities of societies to expand. Uh, the Romans solved it very nicely by um, building this vast network of storehouses and transportation networks that were very, very well managed and run. But did they waste anything? No, I, I, I believe the food has always been too valuable to waste in, in a world where uh, hunger has always truly really just been around the corner. And I guess what we're seeing now is uh, the impact of such a miraculous change, the impact of the, the chemical inputs and industrial agriculture has done, had such a, an effect on us uh, that we really have been left reeling by it. Uh, so I would love to give you a, a more interesting answer, but I really do think that, that uh, no one's ever experienced anything like this before. Thank you. Hello there. Uh, thank you for sharing your work. My name is Peter Bodano. I'm a graduate student at Harvard working on a food security project in the developing world. Um, considering how slow our current political and economic institutions are to change according to what we're seeing as the, the trend of history being what it is right now, I'm wondering uh, two things. First, have you seen entrepreneurs out there who are looking to disrupt the way things are being done now and make changes happen? Uh, and two, going along with that, do you see a role for entrepreneurs, whether these are business entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs, political entrepreneurs, do you see a role for them to change the course and disrupt the current course of our food empires towards a more sustainable future? Hmm. Um, thank you very much for your question. I, I think that um, 
that raises a very valid point in that um, most of, the, I think, the real change and the really progressive ideas that are being implemented to our questions of food and food security are being done at a very, very low, uh, well, not low, but a municipal or a personal or a small level. It's not happening on international policy levels. It's happening uh, within towns. It's happening within community-supported agriculture. It's happening uh, through um, individual store owners who realize that uh, they can make a profit by uh, running a 100-mile market, say, where everything is bought from the local area and figuring out ways in which to profit through that. Um, in fact, uh, uh, one of the examples we use in our book uh, of a mini food empire that's solving problems within a, uh, um, a fairly small scale is, is a shop called the 100 Mile Market in Meaford, Ontario, which um, only buys and only uh, sells uh, produce and meat and uh, supplies that, that are produced within a very small geographic range. And people go to it within the community knowing that they may be paying a little bit more than they would be paying at the, uh, the grocer at the supermarket, but um, they are getting a quality product and it's proving profitable. And we've seen certainly within the, uh, you know, the past 10, 15 years, the explosion of, of um, I, uh, the organic business. Um, you know, even if even if Starbucks only uses three percent fair trade coffee, um, that's still an awful lot of coffee. And so, yes, there, there are initiatives being done on the private level, um, which do address a lot of, uh, or which are attempting to address these problems. And hopefully, it builds up enough. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, they may be pebbles in the, uh, at the beginning of a landslide, but hopefully enough of them will gain momentum that it does shift the way that, that people spend their money. Uh, and enough people will realize that, that, that food and eating is, is a political act as well as a uh, biological one. And they'll um, take the appropriate steps to support such initiatives. Thank you. I'm <coughs> wondering if you're analysis would lead you to uh, make a, uh, a prediction for the future of the San Joaquin Valley of California, uh, which is for many ways the largest producer of uh, food for the United States as well as the rest of the world. Uh, and yet it might be stuck in the same Maybe not. Maybe they have figured out a way <laughs> to not do it. That's what my question is. Did your analysis get as low as something like the San Joaquin Valley? Uh, have they found ways there to counter the things that the other civilizations did not? Thank you. Um, we, we do have a chapter on California and on the, uh, the growth of uh, the, uh, the food industry in California over the past century. And of course, California is one of the great success stories of uh, the modern industrial food uh, system, uh, or it was. Uh, now we are beginning to see the effects of the uh, uh, loss of, gra of usable groundwater. The uh, I mean, water is particularly a big problem in California right now. Um, the uh, the fact that many of their transportation networks and distribution networks require so heavily on uh, very expensive methods of, of refrigeration and whatnot. But um, California is um, also an interesting uh, situated place because you have a lot of awareness there. That, that's also the birthplace of the idea of organic farming. That's the birthplace of the idea of uh, a, lo a lot of the uh, sustainable initiatives. And um, I was out there uh, a little while ago uh, when I was researching into the book, and I visited a farm uh, maybe about an hour and a half south of San Francisco along the, uh, along the coast, which um, it was a, a farm which I, I'd seen them selling tomatoes at a farm stand downtown, and so I drove down to check out the actual farm, and they claimed that they were using you know, purely organic inputs and that the reason that they were able to grow such delicious tomatoes was because of the natural situation of the farm on a mountainside, which got this particular rainfall from the coast, just the, the way that the clouds broke on it. And that enabled them to, um, to produce uh, some very flavorful, tasty produce. Um, so 
I think Californians are extremely aware of, of uh, what's going on, but you're not going to obviously fill up all the, uh, you're, you're not going to sell hundreds of millions of tons of tomatoes based on farming methods like that. So yeah, there, there is a pull and a pull between um, what's economically seen as needed and what's ecologically needed. And California is a battleground where, where that's all playing out right now. Yes. Uh, hi, Andrew. Um, so I'm just grateful for your research. <laughs> Um, but I'm a student at Leslie College, and I'm also an intern at Food for Free this semester. Um, and I just have a, a point that was uh, you, you touched upon uh, in the beginning of your discussion about how you noticed some themes that you and Evan were recognizing when you were writing the book, and you had mentioned uh, industrialization and how that has really impacted um, the way our food is grown very unsustainably. And... Um, just all, all, all the other food supply issues that uh, have been brought on through that. Um, but I, I just, I, I can't really, um, I, I, I feel as if globalization is very, um, I mean, that has come out of the industrialization. And I know that you highlighted the, uh, some civil, some empires, uh, the medieval, um, the European medieval um, empire specifically. It seemed as if that empire was very dependent on itself and it wasn't very influenced on other empires, whereas the American empire today, um, where globalization is just such an important part of our lives and uh, we have this privatization of, of, of water going on and we have agreements with all other Latin American and Central American countries and the NAFTA and CAFTA agreements and we're we're basically getting our food from all over the world. Um, McDonald's gets their meat from New Zealand. So um, I just, I wanted you to discuss a little bit more about how globalization today is, um, is almost a little bit different than how these empires have declined. Um, and, um, a very good point. Um, I, I think everyone's aware that um, our economies and our, uh, our food empire is, more than interconnected, it, it, we are all really part of the same pool of of money and farms and transportation networks um, nowadays. So that when you do have a drought in Australia, you end up having food riots in Haiti. When you do, uh, when there's uh, a dry summer in northern China, you will end up having uh, the economic effects trickling over into. Um, you know, supermarkets in, in uh, Louisiana. And uh, it's so interconnected and so intermeshed right now that um, we do have to, of course, be aware of uh, and be concerned when something happens like what happened during last summer in, in 2010 when the severe drought in Russia led Russia to cut off uh, their grain exports. And um, some pundits have said that that led directly to the unrest in the Middle East. Now, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, a causal jump, but did it affect things? Of course it did. Um, I think what we're going to see is a greater danger from globalization as um, food prices become more volatile because countries like India and China now that they're players on the commodities markets and are able to buy their food on the open market, that means that they will, there will be less food uh, globally available for countries that can't pay for it, which will increase um, unrest in uh, Africa. It may cause migration. It may cause um, civil conflict. Uh, you know, it may cause uh, it, the, uh, an increase of uh, political instability. As countries that can afford their food may lower barriers, may uh, try to become more protectionist. I mean, do I think that at any time soon our supermarkets will go bare? No, they won't. But we will feel the effects of the super or of the shop of the store shelves going bare in places uh, in North Africa or uh, in South Asia. And we would be foolish not to understand that that we are all part of the same market and part of the same uh, food empire. Um, of course, this has been going on for a while, 
and uh, you could trace it back to the beginnings really of refrigeration in the 19th century and the beginnings of, uh, and then in the 20th century, the creations of things like uh, GATT and uh, you know, the World Trade Organization and whatnot. But now uh, it's, it's a, a, a fairly blind person, I think, who wouldn't acknowledge that, um, you know, a, uh, if a tree falls in uh, Brazil, then you're probably going to hear it in Alaska. So, thank you. Uh, Susan Shamel, thank you for your talk, very interesting. I wondered if besides all the um, other issues you looked at in terms of pr being able to produce food, if you, you know, with droughts and floods and loss of topsoil and peak oil and fossil fertilizers, all those issues, if you also looked at the accumulation of pollutants in our atmosphere, because ground level ozone levels are um, rising. The, the U.S. cleverly redefined them, so they're redefining peak ones and saying peak or declining, but background ozone is rising, and ozone is very toxic to plants. Plants are more sensitive to ozone than people. In fact, there was a $2 billion loss to the soybean crop last year because of ozone, and I know other countries have documented this as well. And it's not just ozone, there's other chemicals that are resulting from our fossil fuel combustion, like periacetyl nitrites, which is also harmful to plants, and I'm just wondering, oxus oxide, and you know, there's a lot of issues that are, that are causing um, a decrease in plant production around the world, including um, putting too much carbon dioxide up there, People, you know, Congress thinks that that's great for plants, but actually, if a plant gets too much carbon dioxide, they close their stomata. It's like they're getting too much, you know, it's like if we get too much oxygen or something, they're closing the stomata and they're actually producing less. So I get, my question is, did you look at all into pollutants and how they are accelerating and how that may affect the food security and food production issues? Thank you. Um, yes, we did. My co-author um, visited a facility in China where uh, they're conducting a study on precisely that issue. They are, uh, it's a farm, uh, very similar to all the other rice paddy farms nearby it, but where they're blasting uh, different levels of ozone and different uh, levels of pollutants onto the, onto the crops and trying to mimic the effects of what they believe will be uh, our future atmosphere and seeing and recording the results of that. And, uh, it's not good. Um, yeah, um, it, it's, it's going to have a negative effect, uh, or, or so it seems from, from the initial research. Uh, of course, I mean, there are people who say that an increase of up to two degrees Celsius in our overall atmosphere is going to have a, a positive effect on plant growth. And it very well may, and it probably will in certain areas, um, but other ones will, as I said, become more arid. The entire um, productive zone will, will retreat away from tropical areas. And then if climate change leads to more than two, uh, two degree increase, then um, well, everything will get worse. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you for sharing your work with us. Um, my question is policy related. Yes. If you were forced to choose between two policies, two okay. policy recommendations, Okay. Uh, one that focuses on um, creating incentives and mandates for producers uh, to be more sustainable in their practices and sustainable agriculture practices, uh, and one that was targeted um, primarily at educating consumers and marketing, uh, influencing marketing to consumers. Which do you think would be more effective? Why would you and why would you choose that one? Oh, huh, well, what, what an interesting question. Thank you. Um, I, I, I wish Evan were here because he's, he's our policy guy. Um, I, I'm just the journalist. Uh, but, um, okay, I'll take a stab at this one. Why not? Um, I guess I would go for the first option. I, I, I think I would uh, simply because it, it would strike me as uh, being a more direct way to address the, the, uh, the, the question. If there are economic incentives for farmers to change their methods, then they'll respond to them. On the other hand, uh, the second option you said would be to increase education uh, so that consumers would opt for the more sustainable practices. Well, we're already doing that, aren't we? I mean, you see a lot of, a lot of uh, I mean, everyone knows what their cycling symbol is. Everyone uh, responds to the idea of green products, responds to the idea 
of, um, you know, if I pay five cents more for this particular type of paper towel, I'll save the earth. We haven't done that yet, though. Um, so I would say we do need uh, government policies that do directly give economic incentives to changing the way we run things. I think that's true. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for these last three questions, okay? okay. With everyone, anybody else that was wanting to come up? So why don't we do these three more questions? Great. And this can be quick. You were saying that chemical fertilizers is part of the story of how our civilization has been able to grow so much grain and feed so much people, so many people, and therefore feed a lot of animals and increase the amount of protein that we've all got, et cetera. We know that one. The other one that I've been hearing is that if we could return to just using organic methods, we could in fact feed everybody. And then of course there's the other piece that says if we could get cattle on the unused and degraded millions of acres in places like Australia, uh, the cattle would, you know, between their hoofs and their, uh, what they leave out the back of them, they turn the ground over and it makes everything fertile again. So um, I'm curious what, with all the research you've done, where do you come in on that? Do you think that organic methods are in fact going to be able to produce as much food as we've gotten through the chemical fertilizer process? Well, uh, thank you. Um, that, that was very evocative, thank you. Um, <laughs> the, um, can organic inputs and can our organic fertilizers uh, maintain the same level of productivity that chemical ones do? That, that is a controversial question, and from what I've read, and from what Evan tells me, and from, I think, a recent study uh, that was just finished in the UK, um, what I've, I've seen is that, no. Applied correctly, I think that it, it there are, you, you can maintain certainly acceptable uh, levels, or certainly pr uh, very high levels of productivity due to organic inputs, but we wouldn't have gotten to the point where we can sustain six billion people, or soon to be nine billion people, six billion of which will be living in, in urban areas, without uh, resorting to the Haber-Bosch process and without resorting to fixing nitrogen due to uh, chemical means. Um, I'm not saying that organic inputs cannot be apply better and more widely and used in ways which um, we can redistribute uh, our thinking, uh, redistribute our, um, or rethink our, our, our agricultural areas so that they are, can supply enough food to, to feed nine billion people. But chemical fertilizers are a very direct way of plugging the hole and filling the gap. Um, I think we probably could feed our population on organic inputs from what I've, discussions I've had um, on, the, on the topic, but we would have to rethink things and we would have to redistribute things. And I love the idea of, of using cattle in, in the marginal lands of Australia to, um, to do that. Um, I think that, that sounds very creative and, and, and um, um, very, very probably a good solution to a lot of things. Um, but I, I think to put it bluntly, uh, we would not have gotten where we are today without the chemical inputs. Can we maintain where we are today by getting rid of the chemical inputs? I think at some point we're going to have to. I don't think we'll have a choice. Um, I think fossil fuels are simply going to become too expensive and, and uh, too, uh, too rare. So thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Jean Mason. Um, I'm one of those who can uh, lose sleep over wondering how we're going to feed people. And not just six million, billion, but uh, I live in a, in a place called co-housing and I worry about how we're going to feed a hundred, hundred people if there's some kind of an event or a disaster of some kind, uh, or, in, or just simply in the future. Um, I would like to bring just a tiny little bit of hope, though, to this 
uh, rather grim conversation. And the, I wonder if you know of, of an organization in this area called Red Tomato. Red Tomato is a small group that puts its efforts into um, uh, creating and managing and brokering um, the produce of a local area. And it seems to me, you talked earlier about regionalism, and um, I wonder how much thinking there is g going on about regionalism. It seems like, it, it seems so much like your 100 mile market. Is that what you call it? In Canada. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, if there's more thinking about that around here or around in any, any urban center. Well, um, thank you for your question. And um, I very much believe that there is. I, I think it's uh, the awareness of uh, ideas like of food miles, of uh, the carrying capacity of land, and of uh, the, the provenance of uh, your, your, your celery or your, uh, or your beef steak uh, has very much entered the public consciousness. Um, we haven't gone to the point where food miles, for instance, are marked on, on produce, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we soon saw it in certain places. Um, if you go to some of a lot of fine dining restaurants now, one of the big selling points is, is uh, they flag locally grown, locally produced. Um, you know, this, you know, your, your, your uh, whatever your um, your ribeye steak is uh, from within, uh, it's from a farm within 85 miles, and uh, the beets you're eating in your, your beet salad are from next door. And that has very much, I think, entered uh, the popular um, style and popular uh, fashion. Um, the question is whether or not that can really translate into feeding an entire population as opposed to just being a matter of fashion. And I think that transition is, is the one where we make the jump from you know, pop culture almost to policy, which is the tough one to make. And as long as uh, people have a cheaper option, they seem to usually go for it, uh, regardless of the, uh, the hidden costs. Um, I do think that's changing, though. I do think there's reason for optimism. I do think that uh, it's getting to the point where uh, it will change and people will make demands and will not buy what they view as a, uh, a lower quality product. So, thank you. Hi, I, I'm Stuart Kurtz. Um, you, you mentioned educating the consumer. Uh, I, I've heard that we'd be a much better planet if, if we all uh, you know, switched to vegetarianism. You know, it takes 12, I'm sure you know, it takes 12 uh, pounds of grain to raise one pound of, of cattle or sheep. Uh, but I think th there are a lot of educated consumers now, you know, who are uh, switching to vegetarianism, but most of them are from the upper tax brackets. Um, I think we have to, you know, work on educating uh, uh, people from lower tax brackets, but I, I think a problem with that is the profit motive. Vegetarian food is much more expensive than meat. If you, if you look in the supermarket, you want Morningstar Farms and all of these uh, veggie patties, they're very expensive usually. So what can we do to, uh, to work on uh, taking away the profit motive and edu you know, educating uh, uh, corporations to, uh, to, to make this uh, a slow switch or at least a big leap toward vegetarianism? Thank you for your question. Um, first of all, just um, jump into that by saying um, I don't believe that vegetables and grains and uh, uh, vegetarian foodstuffs are actually cheaper at the checkout counter than, than meat if you um, purchase rice or uh, uh, seasonal vegetables. Very often they are, with it. if you fill a grocery basket with those, it's cheaper than filling it with, with uh, many types of meat. I think processed meats can certainly be very, very cheap, and that's part of the profit motive of what you're talking about. But in our previous book, Beef, um, that was one of the, the topics that, that we really addressed as to why do people opt um, to, to eat meat throughout all of history? Why have they always pursued meat? And uh, that was one of the, 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 
the real cultural questions we looked at. It wasn't always advertising. Human beings do have a taste for it, and uh, they will find it very hard to give it up simply because of uh, being told that it's better for them not to, to eat it or it's better for a society not to eat it. People have fought wars over meat. People have uh, worshipped it. People have um, well, worshipped the animals that produce it. Um, it's it's to, to make a, a decision consciously not to consume it based on uh, what, what you see as self-preservation or, or ideology is a jump most people haven't been able to do or, or wouldn't do if you look at it historically. And um, I certainly think that with education, now there are many initiatives that, that, are, that are now educating people, as you, you say, in the, the uh, lower tax brackets, to try to eat a more healthy, uh, sustainable diet. And um, there's wonderful work being done by Slow Food. Uh, there is wonderful work being done uh, in the city of Boston in order to try to teach people how to purchase fresh produce and cook it, and how to purchase um, you know, fresh greens and uh, fresh meat, which ends up being somewhat cheaper if you, not necessarily always in inner cities because it's not always available, but um, to try to increase availability of those items and uh, try to increase education on how to consume them. Um, so I do think that there is a lot of awareness of that out there, and I think it's certainly moving in the right direction. I, it's, uh, there's a long way to go, obviously, um, and it's going to be a very long time before uh, you know, we, we see the end of um, you know, chicken nuggets as a, uh, as, as a standard uh, dinnertime dish for, for a large portion of the population. But I, I think that we are move, making, taking steps in the right direction, so I think there is a reason for optimism. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew Remus. Thank you, David. You've been listening to a program of Cambridge Forum recorded in April 2011, co-sponsored by Food for Free, the First Parish in Cambridge Unitarian Universalist, the Lowell Institute, and the Friends of Cambridge Forum. For a CD of this radio program entitled Empires of Food, featuring Andrew Remus, or for more information about our ongoing radio series and forum network webcasts, visit us at cambridgeforum.org. In Harvard Square, I'm David Leslie. Thanks for joining us.